Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. It's so good to see you. We are so impressed by all of you out on a Saturday for a conference. So we hope you've been having a good day. We thought we would start. Our initiative talks a lot about the need for our kids and our teachers to be self-regulated. And so in the meetings we start and the trainings we do, um, we kind of always start with a, with a breath activity. And so uh, we'll call it mindfulness because it is mindfulness. But all we're going to really be doing is breathing for just a minute. So. You can close your eyes or you can leave them open, get comfortable in your chairs just to transition us from our lunchtime, which we hope you enjoyed, to just the end of this afternoon. So if you wanna, you, I invite you to close your eyes if you would like. We're gonna take three deep breaths. So ready? Everybody take a breath in and out and in and out and one more. Everybody breathe in and out. Thank you very much. Room, it always amazes us how quiet a room will get, right? And so thank you for doing that with us. So my name is Christy Goss, and I am the project coordinator for a new initiative that's housed at Indiana University. It's called the Indiana School Mental Health Initiative, and I'm a school social worker by training. But back in a former life, before I got my master's in social work, I was a preschool teacher. So I feel like I'm in front of my people. So, um, and you all already know this. Um, there's two greatest times of brain uh, where we really, there's brain development. It's our preschool years, zero to three in the, in the preschool, and then our middle school years. And so what we talk about all the time and what you all do, right, our kids needing to feel safe and feel regulated, get up to, around and move, all the things uh, preschool teachers do, we're talking about the importance of that in all of our classrooms from K through 12. We have concentrated a lot on K through 12 because that's where our capacity and our charge is right now, but we believe being in front of all of you and the work that you do can change everything for the rest of our school. So how do we support you all in what you're doing? And so at the heart of, the, of what we do are three things. We have a community of practice we're building across the state about addressing the social, emotional, mental health, physical health of our students, how critical that is to the academic outcomes we wanna see, to the stress behaviors we see in the classroom and really how, our, how it affects our communities in the long run. And on top of that, we're looking at how do we create a collective impact across our state to really bring in the supports and the resources, the policies um, into our schools with our community partners so that we're able to do that. And the last thing is providing supports and resources to address all of those things. And so again, I'm very grateful to be here today. I am going to talk today, my piece of it, before I let Terry introduce herself. So I am gonna cover this first part of this. How many of you are aware of adverse childhood experiences? If you could raise your hand. So we, we it's so, it is so awesome because we have been doing this for about a year and a half now and often we would stand in front of people and it still happens and present and nobody really knew about adverse childhood experiences. And so understanding the science behind that um, the stress response at the end of the day, I'm gonna talk quite a bit about this because we need to understand the stress response in, in order to understand the importance of understanding adverse childhood experience. And even more important, we're gonna talk about resilience today because that's what we can do. That's the hope. And so I'm gonna talk about that today. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, effect it has on your students, and then Terry's gonna really dig in after me. Um, more on, we know you had some this morning about how brains develop, right? But the effects of technology, not only technology, um, you have preschoolers, right? So hopefully they're not on technology all the time, but unfortunately they have iPads in front of them and, they're, and we are disconnected in lots of ways because people are looking at the technology. So she's gonna really dig into that as well as strategies after I finish. So that is what I am gonna cover today. I'm gonna let Terry introduce herself. I just told him what you're gonna cover. I won't, I won't repeat it then. Okay. So good, good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Again, we're thrilled um, about how many people are here. This topic, I, I, I think all the stuff you're talking about is so important and I'm very thrilled to be here. I'm a school psychologist by training. Um, I've been doing the, the working with children thing for over 30 years. Um, I, have a, a, I was able to take a, a get a certification in educational neuroscience about a year and a half ago from Laurie Desitel, um, who I think some of you are go you're gonna hear about her, about some of her work, either already have or you hear tomorrow, uh, later on this afternoon. Um, and also, um, I, I love the world of, of mental health 
and what is it that we all have mental health and I love being able to talk about that and think about the stigma that's attached to that and how some of that causes more of the stress that we have. And so this being able to be in front of early childhood educators is so important and I'm so, we haven't had the opportunity to do this so we're thrilled and very excited to be here for that. So I'll turn it back over to you. And so we wondered who was in the room today. Could you raise your hand if you're a pre, an elementary, uh, an early childhood educator, your teacher? <clears throat> do we have administrators in here, early childhood administrators? Very good. Do we have parents in the room? That's wonderful. We have parents in the room. Do we have support staff? Is there support staff in the room? Do you mind sharing support staff? Or you? Do you mind sharing? School nurse. That's awesome. That's awesome. You're here. Yes. Speech therapist, awesome. Yes. Skills development. Skills development. So, because we, when we talk about this, it's about bringing this everybody, it's a climate change, right, in our schools and what we do from bus driver through superintendent, about bringing this to everybody because it's all of us. It used to Count be as a, counselors and mental health providers. Do you have counselors or mental health providers in the room? And we had over here, so thank you very much. Because as a school social worker, right, you often, when there's social, emotional, behavioral, um, mental health issues in a classroom with your students, they, you, they often get sent to you down the hallway as, and then you are supposed to work your magic and they're supposed to come back. But we're really talking a lot about how critical this piece is to the educational outcomes and to bringing it to our gen ed teachers and so especially to our preschool teachers because if we can change it here we can change it it really affects the rest of our schools like we said so so i'm going to dig into and this is right trauma we're going to start with trauma but we're going to talk about it it's important to understand we throw we talk we say trauma a lot nowadays right you hear trauma-informed practices talking about adverse childhood experiences creating trauma-informed systems but let's it's important that we all have a shared understanding of what trauma is and at the end of the day trauma is about our stress response and we all understand our stress response because we all know what it's like to feel stressed right and so there's really three components to trauma there's first exposure to a trauma right so you, you two people can be exposed to a trauma let's say right it's community violence we'll just say that that's that's what it is right and so you have the two people exposed to that. But what we know, the fact that you're exposed to the trauma doesn't mean that you're going to have a traumatic, traumatic response. And so what are the two components that then have to be in place for a trauma to have occurred? It overwhelms the person's ability to respond in a healthy way, physically, emotionally, or mentally, right, cognitively. Um, and it creates significant difficulties in functioning. Right? For our children and our youth, it has significant impact on their social, emotional, and cognitive development. And we all can think of two people who have been through a similar trauma, right? And we know one of them goes on and functions in their life, and they do fine, right? And then you know another person, same trauma, they've been through the same experience in some way, and you know that they're having significant difficulties and functioning and what's the difference between those and you can already think what makes a difference in somebody being able to go on what I'm asking you guys that question what and at the end of the day that's resilience so what are some of the things that make a difference in someone's life that allow them to withstand the exposure to a trauma yes Stability, so relationships, is that a fair thing to say? Relationships are the number one resiliency factor. What else? Think of your students. What are coping strategies, right? Things that you do, that are, you can calm yourself down, you can take care of yourself. Some people will point to faith, right? Whatever it may be. Somebody in the back Oh, yep. Where am I looking? Where am I looking? I'm sorry. Yes. How you frame that story. How you frame the story, the story that you're telling in your head, right? Absolutely. Yes. The accumulation of the other times they've dealt with that type of trauma. That it, that's, it's so important. The accumulation of how many times you've dealt with that trauma or perhaps multiple traumas, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so what we're talking about at the end of the day are those protective and resiliency factors, right? Because all of us in our lives are going to face adversity and stress. And our kids, 
for a variety of reasons, and Sari's going to talk about it more this afternoon or experience it more than ever, right? And so what if we are in the business of creating resilient kids? And the beauty of it is, right, is that now we know through the educational neuroscience, it's deeply connected to their academic outcomes. Right, and we're, so that's what we're gonna talk about today. So, and, and again, Terry's gonna touch on this, but what is the primary purpose of our brains? What is the primary purpose of our brains? Survival, yes, I love this. Like, I feel like they, where people have this, and so, but we still stand in front of, especially educators, right, and they're like learning, and you know, those, kind, those things, right, that they come to school for, and we go very quickly up there, right? And you all have probably felt it, even unfortunately at the early childhood level, of the need for those academic content and all of those things, right, very quickly. But what we're learning about brain development, right, is that first our kids need to feel safe. They need to be able to emotionally regulate. They need to be able to get along, those social emotional learning skills, right? They need to feel connection and purpose and relationship. That's priming the brain for learning. And then that cognitive development, right? That learning in school where we hit really heavy now with testing and all of those things, that comes naturally, right? And so how do we spend the time down here? And that is what, that is what you all do so beautifully. That is what you do. You're teaching the kids to have all of those skills. Right, and they're coming in more dysregulated than they ever have, which Terry's gonna talk about, and you know this, because you see it. When we stand in front of K through 12, right, and we ask, what are your biggest challenges? We start talking about these things. Inevitably, we have kindergarten and first grade teachers raise their hand, and they, it doesn't matter if it's what the school district or community looks like, right? We can be in small rural, we can be in urban, we can be IPS and Carmel, and we can go up to Fort Wayne and East Chicago. Inevitably, kindergarten and first grade teachers raised their hand and said, the kids are so different. They're coming in dysregulated, they're coming in not ready to learn, they can't sit still. And so, right, because we're not, they're co we know, we look at the media, social media, we live in stressed out worlds. And so how do we take that time in preschool to really start addressing these things? And so again, it's important to understand the stress response, right, in all of us. So there's positive stress, right, that our kids experience, that we experience, that got Terry and I here today, ready to give you guys a presentation, right? We needed some stress in our lives to do that. We also all know what it feels like to have tolerable stress, right? They, we lived, live in stressed out worlds with lots of things, we're busy all the time, it seems there's always something else that we need to do, but because we have protective factors, right, we have coping skills, we have relationships, we do things to take care of ourselves, um, we can push through those. The issue is when we have toxic stress in our lives, and that's what I talked about in that first slide, that's where tra trauma comes from. And what we know with our students is when they enter into that area, their social, emotional, and cognitive development is severely impaired. And it's, we need to really be looking at that as we're trying to change outcomes. And so Terry and I like to give this analogy when it comes to trauma and really frame it in the form of resilience. Because as we learn the science of trauma, if you will, science of the adverse childhood experiences, we need to even more importantly understand the science of resilience because that is what we can do. And so this is the analogy we like to use. You have two palm trees in a hurricane, right? Two of them, and they're experiencing, they're right next to each other. And they're experiencing the same trauma, if you will, of the winds that are coming up against them. One snaps and breaks, and the other one stands firmly. And we'll often say that the trauma, trauma occurred because that, that tree snapped in half. But that is not actually trauma. Trauma is the fact that one of those did not have the protective factors around it like the other one did. So in the case of a tree, it might be stronger roots, right? It had stronger internal factors to it. It was protected from the outside in some way, right? And so that is what we're talking about. How do we build those resiliency skills in our children? And so that's more important. We need to know adverse childhood experiences, which I'm gonna talk about. But more importantly, we have to understand the resilience factors and how we can affect them as teachers and educators and parents um, and how we do that together. And so we're gonna show a short video on adverse childhood experiences that does a much better job than I could do and then we're gonna dig into them a little bit. So. 
What does your parents' divorce have to do with your risk for heart disease? If your mother had a drinking problem when you were growing up, are you more likely to suffer from depression as an adult? Here's what you should know about ACEs. ACEs stand for Adverse Childhood Experiences, extremely stressful events that can happen to a child growing up. Some experiences are so stressful that they can alter brain development as well as the immune system, increasing the risk of lifelong health and social problems in adulthood. The term comes from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, landmark research that shed new light on the root cause of everything from stroke and liver disease to substance abuse and mental illness. In the late 1990s, an epidemiologist from the Centers for Disease Control and a preventive medicine doctor at Kaiser Permanente set out to understand the association between childhood experience and lifelong health. They asked over 17,000 people in the Kaiser Health Plan in San Diego about their health history, as well as difficult questions about their experiences growing up. tallied up 10 different kinds of adversity in this largely middle-class and college-educated population. They were stunned to see how common ACEs were. 21% of all respondents were sexually abused as children. 19% grew up with someone who suffered mental illness. 28% had been physically abused. And two out of three respondents had experienced at least one ACE. The researchers next looked at how someone's ACE score, or the number of adversities they experienced, related to a wide array of serious health and social problems. They saw that the more ACEs someone had, the greater their risk for poor outcomes compared with someone with no ACEs. Someone with an ACE score of four had twice the risk of heart disease and cancer. Someone with an ACE score of five had an eight times greater chance of being an alcoholic. And those with an ACE score of six or more, on average, died 20 years earlier. With every major problem they looked at in the ACE study, the risk went up for each additional adverse experience in childhood. As Dr. Robert Anda says, what's predictable is preventable. It's important to remember that ACEs are not destiny. ACEs are a tool for understanding the health of a population as a whole. For individuals, an ACE score can be a tool for understanding their own risk for health and social problems and empower them to make changes for themselves and their children. ACEs tend to get passed down from generation to generation and are common across all income levels, races, and cultures. But increasingly, people of all different professions and backgrounds are coming together to discuss how ACEs affect their communities. They're finding new ways to treat and prevent ACEs. Many doctors are starting to screen their patients for ACEs as part of their medical history. More schools are becoming trauma-informed, considering the source of problem behavior when disciplining their students instead of immediately suspending or expelling them. To learn more about interrupting the cycle of adversity and improving health and well-being for the next generation, please visit kpjrfilms.co.
And so you guys, we are doing the worst thing right now, right? You've been sitting there listening to me talk at you for a little bit. So I'm going to ask you guys, there's, what are the two things, the two things you can do um, to s regulate students and yourselves? What are the two best things you can do? I, exercise. exercise movement and we did it at the beginning. Breathing, movement and breath. And so we, you guys need to move a little bit. So get that brain moving and all that. So I'm gonna ask you to stand up in just a minute and you're gonna pick a partner near you. And if, you, if it's three, that's fine too. And first person's gonna say, you're gonna have 20 seconds to say without saying and or butter is what your biggest takeaway, something you just learned from that or you were surprised about, and then we'll reverse it. So go ahead and stand up. <clears throat> and go ahead first person to the other person okay we'll bring you back uh, so right we often when we think of trauma we tend to think of those kids in that community right and that's why it's important to understand stress response of all of us but at the same time we're going to talk about this there are some factors beyond this right poverty has become a very included on the ACEs study. The original ACEs study had these first 10, which I've got on this slide, right? But ACEs at the end of the day are about perception of the event, that a person, right, or a child, how they feel in regards to their safety. We talked about resilience, that they have resilience factors, right? These are the original 10. And we don't have time today, but we often with our educators, We'll do a slide where we, we pull them anonymously and it shows up here how many ACEs our educators have. And it ha our educators have high, we all have ACEs in our communities, right? And understanding how they impact us. But what you were just saying, right, it's about perception too. What are those resiliency factors around kids that we can build, right, to help them withstand ACEs? And now lots of other things have been added to what are considered adverse childhood experiences, depending on how they affect a child or affect us. Death or loss of a loved one, and you all could add to this list. We know that life-threatening illnesses but from a caregiver, bullying and social exclusion, which Terry will dig into a bit this afternoon when she follows me, community violence, natural disasters, economic hardship and poverty has been one that's really they've really been starting to study being a young caregiver right we have lots of kids in our schools young children who are coming in and they're having to take on roles adult responsibilities and how that affects them and the last microaggressions does anybody know what a microaggression is i feel like this room knows more than they're telling me at the right now so microaggressions and i i saw somebody speak on this and it's when you're in in not the dominant culture right and you, maybe your name's being mispronounced at school over and over again, right? And your culture, because there's a dominant culture, how that actually affects a child, right? If it happens over and over and over again. And so that is being considered an ACE as well if there's not resiliency factors surrounding them. And so this is Indiana. This is some Indiana data. I'll just let you look at it. It's concerning in and of itself, right? But Indiana is one of a handful of states that does not collect ACEs data meaningfully within the states we rely on federal data so we like to show Washington state because they they have collected it for a long time in a very meaningful way and you can see how many kids sit inside our classrooms that have high ACE scores and ACEs are cumulative right and so they said this in the study I won't spend a lot of time but the, it's a dose response right so the more ACEs you have the more likely you're going to have poor outcomes. Health, it's the number one a predictor of poor health outcomes. It's the second greatest predictor of poor educational outcomes, right? And the first predictor is being assigned to special education. And what we also know is a lot of our kids who have IA scores, there's nothing wrong with their IQs, right? There's, they should probably not be in special ed. We're just not responding to them, to their needs. So that they can stay in the gen ed classroom and so mental health you can see it's zero aces to four aces chronic diseases workforce we talk a lot in the state about changing our workforce outcomes right this is a huge predictor of our poor poor workforce outcomes um, i won't go through all of these but at the end of the day this is the one that we really care about we're educators right and we say all the time these are community issues they're not just 
they're not just school issues at the end of the day, but the greatest place that we can really impact these in a proactive way is in our schools. We know it's connected to academic outcomes, and, the, and I would argue that beyond that, the best place to really address this is early on with our early childhood educators. <clears throat> and so, just look at that first statistic. 51% of children with four plus ACEs, 51% have learning and, and behavior, we say stress behavior, problems in schools, compared with only 3% who have no ACEs. If that is not a call to action, right, what's predictable is preventable, I don't know, I don't know what is. And so you all know what it looks like in your classrooms. The ones we have to be careful of, right, we see the outward manifestation of that. Our kids are dysregulated. Um, they're often, you know, I was a school social worker, so I know. It's the one you think, maybe they won't be here today, and you kind of have a sigh of relief, right? But it's a change in lens about where that behavior is coming from. And so the collaborative, there's Castle Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning um, did a multi-tiered study, right? And so estimating the, the greatest predictor of having positive academic outcomes, right? And that's what we, our schools need to address at the end of the day. So the most powerful influence is not how well trained our teachers are, because all of you have never been better trained than you have to bring the content into the classrooms, K through 12, early childhood, never been better trained, right? It's not how beautiful our schools are. It's not how much we test our kids. It's the social emotional, we'll say the invisible backpacks they're carrying into the classroom. How they feel safe, how they're able to self-regulate, how um, they feel a sense of purpose in the classrooms. All of these things are critical for them to be able to sit and to learn. So how much time are we spending teaching them? These are taught skills, which is what you all do all day long. And so this quote, we find it important, right? So we tend to view misbehavior, and I'll say stress behavior, but this is a quote, so I couldn't change it, as resistance because we understand where we want children to go, right? So we get frustrated because you guys came into this profession, our teachers did, to make a difference in children's lives. And they come in with beautiful content, and they want to give them these educations so they can go on and live purpose in their lives and change our communities. And you get frustrated because they can't sit still, they can't learn, right? But children view stress behavior as a protection because they know where they've been. And that's that change in lens. It's that needed perspective shift, which we hear about when we talk about trauma-informed practices, right? Not what's wrong with you, but what's happened. And when we switch that mindset, right, it becomes less about like, right, we take it internally that we can't seem to do something to make a change in our classroom, but instead we look at this child as more of a puzzle and how can we help you? And so again, the counterbalance of trauma is resilience. And to look at resilience and building resiliency factors, instead of focusing on the trauma, we focus on the resilience and it moves away from a deficit model to a strengths model. And that empowers all of us and gives us hope. And at the end of the day, so we hear about the pillars of trauma-informed practices, safety, connection, managing emotions. We know these are deep, this is how the brain develops. Trauma-informed practices are directly related to how our brains develop. And so how do we address all those things in our classrooms and in early childhood so that our kids are ready to learn? And so with that, I'm gonna go, this goes to our, our handout, and I just wanna transition to Terry. You guys have this. We think it's an excellent handout for parents as well. All parents want their kids to do well, right? So bringing this information to parents about how they can help, understanding adverse childhood experience and how they can build resiliency in their kids. And so you have this handout, but people will often say to me, as we're going, and Terry, as we're going around, right, so there's always been stress in our world. There's always been violence. There's been times in history that have been more stressful than they are right now. What's the difference, right? So it's a complicated, these are complicated things because our mental health statistics are off the charts. But what we know, we can point to a couple things our constant news cycle of everything coming at us, and social media. And so Terry's gonna talk a little bit about that with you. 
can you talk just a little bit at the back of this as well? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. All right. Also, I, I love this handout just because um, if you look at the one side, it's talking about ACEs, okay? And many times we think it's, it's, it's such a downer, right? We think about all these things that are happening to our youth and to our, our, and our adults, what has happened to them. But the other side, it's that resiliency thing, okay? Because it gives us the hope. Okay, so if we can identify what might be causing some of the, the behaviors that we're seeing in the class, that means that we can address it and we have the hope by putting some of these resiliency protective factors in there. And I just, I don't know, I think all of you got to see Leslie's presentation. This was looking through her slides and actually so much of what she put in there are some of those environmental factors that can be added for our kids who they have to be able to know exactly what's expected. So putting those visuals in place and such really do help with those kids who are coming in. We, don't, we know they're coming in with some stuff. We don't know what. Okay, but it's but no having those expectations very clear through those visuals that you were able to hear about from Leslie is awesome. So um, actually, but I want to do a little movement. I know we don't have a ton of time, but everybody gets to stand up. Okay, again, all right. And some of you may have done this, but our brains need movement and breath, and also novelty is awesome is a good thing. Okay, so we're going to do something that some of you may have done before, but some of you may not. So hopefully, it's a novel thing. So what did, what I need for you to do is everybody have their pinky up and their thumb up on their other hand. You don't have to have it up. I'm doing it so you can see me. Okay, and then you switch them. Okay, so this goes th th pinky and this goes thumb, and then switch them again. Thumb pinky. I love you guys' faces. <laughs> Pinky thumb. It is hard. It's novel. Okay, let's get our brain working. It's something different. I love that you're stretching. Okay, Thou and some people start, you can't do this. So, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, that's just a little thing to get us, get us up and we're moving a little bit. So, it's good for your brain. So, what do you think? There, we go. there you go. There we it, it go. Well, I oversee occupational therapists, and I always think I need, need them to support me on that. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you for indulging me in a little extra activity there. All righty. So we're going to talk a little bit about screen time. How many of you have kids that are, oh, I see a lot of moaning and groaning, all right? So we're not going to talk about that it's bad, okay? We're just going to talk about the impact because it's, our, it's in our world, right? That's what, that's what it is. We're not going to talk about the violence. We're not going to talk about the impact on, uh, on some of our, uh, the aggression that we might see. We're just going to talk about the impact as related to our young children, okay? As related to our brain development from when they come out and what is it that we need and what do they need for us to be doing that's because of technology has changed has changed how we are reacting as parents, as young caregivers, okay? And so this is a scientific kind of stuff, stuff that's been, technology's been around long enough now to see that what are the changes that are happening as related to what we're learning more and more about our brain and what our brain needs when, for our very young, young children, our little infants. They come out, their brain is not totally developed, okay? And if it's not totally developed, we need to be attached to our, our young children. There needs to be attachment, okay? If we don't attach, guess what? We can't regulate. And that's what we're seeing coming through our doors. Did anybody say that? Would you say you have youth that are coming through your doors that are not regulated, right? Fortunately, I have a sister who owns a, a early child, or owns a preschool in the county. And she loves, loves, loves her job and what she does, okay? And she cries every time she feels like she can't meet the needs of a youth who's unregulated, okay, dysregulated, all right? And so there's so much, how can we get in front of some of that? So I get to hear some of the stories of all the stuff trying to do. So, but how, if we know what's happening in the brain, that can help us to think through some of that stuff, okay, and think about the attachment that can happen. Thank you, Christy. And that, I don't know why it keeps doing that. So, um, what do you think of that little bit? I, I, I envy you guys working with, do most of do you guys have infants or are they um, toddlers? Both? Both? Preschool? Preschool? Okay, so, um, so when we think about our young children, has anybody heard of the word neuroception? I hadn't either until about three or four months ago. Start reading the book called Self-Reg, okay? And it's by, um, self, by Shanker, Shanker, S Simon? 
no, but I don't remember his first name. Shankar is his last name. Self-reg, and it's actually written for parents, but we're reading it as a book study with educators, okay? Going through it together. So he talks about this term, and basically that's the idea of a system deep in the brain that monitors whether a person is safe or dangerous. And you heard from Leslie a little bit about our brain when we do the fight, flight, or freeze, and Christy mentioned that too. Okay, and so our, our youth are coming out not right, quite knowing what's dangerous and what's not coming out, meaning that when they're born, um, what's dangerous and what's not. Okay, we as caregivers, as parents and you as caregivers of youth that are young children who you get to work with, okay, you, to help that, er, that area develop, the brain develop to figure out what is dangerous and what's not. Many of our children are children who come from trauma and don't have some re resiliency factors built around them, they don't know that that whole idea of what's dangerous and what's not, they, don't, they aren't able to, to uh, differentiate that. And then they become, they're dysregulated because their assumption, because our brains are there for us to survive, right? If we think that everything is dangerous because that's what we've known, we, don't, we can't differentiate, all right? So that a look on your face may be something that looks unsafe to a, to a, to a, a youth, a young child. When, that, when I, I'm, as a school psych, I get to hear a lot of people that say to me, I did nothing, I don't know why he did that to me. If we back up and look at some different factors, the lack of resiliency factors, or the, what has gone on with that child, we can usually figure it out if we're honest with each other. So, Thinking about that, I love this graphic because that whole idea of serve and return, meaning a communication, positive or negative, that we do with our young children, is helping to develop their brains in a way that it, we, we want it to be in a positive way. Okay? Our natural reaction, we have mirror neurons in our brains, meaning if I yell at you, What's your natural reaction if you, don't, if you ha don't have resiliency factors or some sort of impulse control? Yell back, yell back hit. I'm going to protect myself because if I yell, especially if it came, I perceive it came out of nowhere, guess what's going to happen? I feel threatened, right? And I'm going to want to do something to protect myself. Why wouldn't I? All right? So that, but knowing that, as a person who's dealing with children, we can then think about, first of all, how do we keep ourselves calm? So when we have this, this uh, serve and return going on, we can bring it back down. We don't want to escalate it. Because that, that nobody wins, right? When you do this, no, nobody wins. Nobody wins. All right, so we have, a, we have a video. Has anybody seen the still face experience video? Have you? Does it make you cry? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the most powerful videos I think I've ever seen in my career. It really shows a lot. Yeah, I won't let you tell. I won't okay. tell the story. But um, has anybody else seen it? Yeah, yeah. So every time I watch it, I, I like, oh my goodness, it's a great reminder of the impact we have on each other, especially our young brains. Okay. So what I'm going to do is ask you what's a takeaway that you can think about after you watch this, if, even if you've already seen it before. So let's go ahead. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I need my good girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby 
puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good is no reparation and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. I read a little bit more about some of this this morning as I was reviewing this and they have some other uh, uh, what I want to say scenarios that they did that are similar and actually it's very stressful on the caregiver okay yeah yeah did you guys feel stress yeah, yeah. I actually showed this with a, a couple of people in the audience that um, were pregnant and oh my gosh, they did, they, they were crying I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't mean to do that. So, uh, but you could see, what, what was striking to you as far as the, the young child? As far as when we think about attachment and regulation. Uh-huh. Yeah, right, right. So yeah, it's not, being there is, is important, right? But being there with that eye contact Present, totally present, right? So that eye contact, that I, if we don't get that, have that eye contact, then that, that's where that attachment isn't happening at the level that it needs to for that regulation to be able to happen for our children. So there may, technology is not causing some of this stuff, but it is a factor that we have got. And I love what you said because, yeah, it's so easy, right? We, who doesn't look at their phone, right? And so, but just thinking the consequence, positive, if we don't look at our phone and we're making the eye contact with our child for us and for them, because we get something out of that too, right? Or else with our, we, we, the, we wouldn't be able to continue to survive. So just think, but also what I love about Shanker's book too, it reminds me, it reminds us as people that work with children that just because a child is quiet does not mean they're regulated or calm. They may appear that way, but if that attachment hasn't happened and they haven't had the opportunity where this mom, she brought the child back. And do you see how quickly the child became okay and mom came okay? But what happens with a child who continuously tries to get attention and doesn't? They just, they just become Unregulated, they look quiet, but they're not engaged and they're not regulated. And the kids that are walking through our, our elementary doors as kindergartners that look like getting off the bus, they're okay, but they get into the classroom and they're not, they're, they're quiet, but they're not calm. And that was so instructional when I read that as, I, as we're, I'm deal, we're dealing with those young children like you are. And that really made a difference to think about how do we get our brains, our kids' brains to calm when, it, when they're showing patterns on a daily basis that they look calm, but then when there's a little bit of chaos, their tipping point is not very long when they tip over and they're, they're dysregulated and unable to be in a social situation in a positive way. So I, just was, I thought this illustration was good. So you see the, the, uh, the, the photo on the right. She's on her phone, like somebody mentioned, very beautifully mentioned. She's there, look, all wrapped up, no eye contact, not really there. But here, obviously, who, they're both just delighted to be with each other and what a difference that that can make. 
All right. But then the, the I Generation is another book that we've been, we've been delving into. You can see the author down there, Twinge. Okay. So this, if you look at, I won't read through all this, but you can see the increase of depression with all of our, with our young children and our teenagers that changed the incidence and the prevalence of depression and other mental health issues has changed once, the, once all of our kids are bringing phones to school and having a lot more screen time available to them. They put it, stick it out of their purse or have it on their desk and it has changed the mental health in a negative way of our children. It's not all bad, but we have got to be aware of this. Another book that would be awesome, it's much more, it's not as exciting, it's not terribly, but it's, it's, it's very informational to read through that. So, um, but just thinking about, these are just, if you know Bruce Perry at all, if you've ever read the book, The, bo the, book, the Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog, he's a neuropsych uh, neuro, neuro, neuropsychologist, and these are the three areas that our brain develops through if we're having all the opportunities for the brain to develop. And I'm just going to, we've already delved into the attachment and self-regulation, all right? If our kids are not attaching, we get to be that caregiver so they can then get to regulation. And if they don't get regulated, guess what? They can't do affiliation because nobody wants to play with them. They don't learn how to affiliate, all right? We'll stop there. But that's just going through as, as, we, as we grow and our brain grows. The hope is that we're getting to tolerance and respect if we're able to go through all the development of our brain. So we want to think about other things that we can do. These, to me, you as educators, as early childhood educators, these just fit right in with I know what you talk about, okay? We need to know about self-regulation in the brain, which is one thing we talked about today. Thinking about appropriate schedules. Uh, Leslie, from looking at her slide, she helped with that, and I'm sure through your other de professional development, you've talked about that. Try to get those times, find those times to engage with kids where technology is not there. Then you have to do that. And that, sometimes that's hard, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard for us to give it up, hard for our kids to give it up. But then there's that balance, too. We know technology can be very helpful. But how do we balance it and make sure it's working for us in a positive way? Connecting and de-stressing as a classroom routine. We kind of started, Christy did that this, morning, or this afternoon, just doing that deep breathing. It takes a minute or two at the most to start the day or start an activity or do a transition by remembering we need to, stay, we need to get to calm so then we, can, we are able to learn and do the social situations in a positive way. And talking about our health, especially sleep. I love that, especially for our teenagers. I know you guys maybe have teenagers at home, you're not teaching them. But our teens, that, that sleep hygiene, get those screens put down before you go into bed. Going outside, we talked about breath and movement, right? And going outside, even if it's a yucky day, it's really good. And then offer high levels of support when students are dysregulated. That's that thing of connecting with them, offering their, knowing what their expectations are the minute they walk in the room. Those things are powerful. As early childhood education, educators, I know you do that. I probably don't realize how powerful some of those things are that you do to take the stress off a child who is not regulated and hasn't had an opportunity to attach, okay? We have two minutes for questions. So do you, what questions, comments do you have? Or Christy, do you have anything to add to what? Any, okay, questions? I know it's hard. I love that you asked that question. A lot of what we get, some of the stuff that we get to do is talking to educators about what you just said like yeah but then how do we teach that to the kids we are teaching our young children about their brains okay talking about we didn't talk about the word amygdala we didn't talk about prefrontal cortex but our kids are learning that and about neuroplasticity so then they're able to, we're able to tell us our, we, my brain is really stormy today able to do that. We also have social emotional learning opportunities that are being brought to our schools, not as quickly as we know needs to happen, but it is happening. We actually had an opportunity to be in front of some, um, the, the big department people downtown to say every school district needs one, at least one person at the district level who is overseeing the social emotional learning and mental health initiatives within their district. Just like we do reading and math, 
we need to be teaching about social emotional learning as well because as the slide that Christy showed, to get the most bang for a buck for academics learning, we got to have the kids regulated and have social emotional learning as a part of what, what is embedded, not another thing, not another, oh, we have to do, do this over here for part of my day. It's embedded into what's happening in the day. It's not going to happen overnight, but I love the question. Does that answer a little bit? Yeah, yeah. You have more to add to that? We have, and that's at the core of our, one of the things we're trying to accomplish with our initiative. And I'll tell you something beautiful, it's happening within this district and then some of the surrounding and spreading to our state is our youth are asking, our, our middle schoolers and high school are forming their own stigma free and mental health clubs because they want their social emotional wellness to be addressed. I mean, they see what's happening. We have the third highest rate in our state of, of suicide ideations we're the, in the country. We're the state with the third highest rate of that. Um, and we could kind of go down the different things. And so our youth, that youth voice is rising in all of this. The importance of us addressing that, which we think is a very powerful thing. And we're trying to support the, that because when we're talking about reducing stigma, that is where it can really originate and we can really make a difference. So, um, so our time is up and we don't want to take time away from the other speakers, but I think at the end of the day, right, you all, as a former preschool teacher from a while ago, you spend a lot of your days, right, sitting on carpets and having kids learn to get along with each other and how to regulate themselves and all of those beautiful things that you do that sometimes maybe you get a little pushback because they need to be able to do all these things to go to, to kindergarten, right? And we are here to reinforce because of the science that time you spend building relationships, teaching them how to self-regulate, building their resiliency factors and how you can connect with the parents. You can do it in ways that often our, our teachers right now find it difficult to do. We're, that's part of what we're trying to address. And so how can we help you also engage with your parents? Because this is a partnership. These are community issues again at the end of the day. So how do we do it together? So thank you all for the work that you do. It's critically important to the work that we do and to our community outcomes. So thank you for having us today.